there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. The term culture originates from the Latin word cultivate. Communities are generally made up of people who share cultural characteristics. These cultural characteristics are defined by various influences, including geographical, spiritual, and agricultural considerations. Certain cultures impose distinct limitations or boundaries that make them unique. The purpose of this program is to introduce you to the most interesting and unique cultures from around the world. Today, we will visit two places geographically far from each other, yet bound by a communist past. The province of Guantanamo on the island of Cuba still suffers under a communist regime. And Latvia's Courland, which is slowly recovering from the damage caused by decades of Soviet Russia's communist terror. Guantanamo. Upon hearing this name, most people think of the United States naval base in Cuba. Few are aware that Guantanamo is a province of Cuba. It lies on the eastern side of Cuba and has a surface area of 6,000 square meters. It has a population of half a million. The most obvious reminders of Castro's regime are the commonplace processions and parades glorifying communist Cuba. April is the official month of culture. At this time of the year, cultural employees, collaborating with the schools, are obliged to take to the streets of the town of Baracoa by storm. They carry banners unchanged for the last 50 years that read, Socialism or death, long live the revolution. Another integral part of such an event is an impressive speech by the communist leader. Cubans are characteristically joyous and thoroughly enjoy the procession. For most people, the parade, meant to popularize the communist regime accompanied by live rhythmical music, is a happy Caribbean street carnival. Walls and cannons are a reminder of a wild past. The town of Baracoa was established by the conqueror Diego Velasquezem in the year 1511, just 20 years after the explorer Christopher Columbus landed here. A statue of Velasquezem adorns the seafront in his memory. Nearby is a stone monument that commemorates the first native settlers, the Taino people. Guantanamo was inhabited by this Indian tribe before the arrival of the Spaniards. The bust of their chief, Hatui, who was burnt at the stake by the Spanish, is situated on the square opposite the old cathedral. Indians no longer live in Cuba. Those that survived the Spanish onslaught were victims of infectious disease introduced to the island by the Spanish. The only remnants are the local names, for example, 
the name Guantanamo comes from the Indian language and loosely translates to a country in between rivers. The river Yumuri is also a name of Indian origin. The last remaining Indians lived on the banks of this river. When these proud people were faced with the prospect of being turned into slaves, they chose instead to sacrifice themselves by jumping off the rocks into the river canyon. The name of the river is Spanish for their death cry. Cuba is an island in the Caribbean Sea. The river Yumuri also flows into the Caribbean, which is the most important source of sustenance for the people of Cuba. They set sail for the open ocean aboard decrepit vessels, reminiscent of Hemingway's famous character in The Old Man and the Sea. The local fisherman Santiago Lafita specializes in going after sharks. He mostly catches blue shark, this shark reaches an average length of 2.5 meters and weighs around 80 kilos. Santiago was lucky today. The catch is larger than usual, so the entire village gathers to have a look. Many other types of fish also thrive in Cuban waters. Marlin, barracuda, tuna, mahi-mahi. Mahi-mahi, also known as common dolphin fish, is specifically considered a delicacy among gourmets. Mahi-mahi feeds on herring and flying fish. Because it is one of the fastest swimming fish, catching it is no easy feat. Farming is an occupation for people living inland. Agricultural production here resembles the Middle Ages. It is done without the benefit of modern conveniences due to communism. The result is inefficiency and poverty. The farmers will likely cultivate vegetables, peppers, pumpkin, tomatoes, and sweet potatoes. Pig breeding is also very common. The pigs are usually fed a kind of palm fruit known as almichi. Clusters of berries growing 40 meters above the ground in the crown of the imperial palm tree are collected. This job requires considerable skill and alertness. The entire cluster weighs up to 30 kilos. Getting it to the ground is a bit tricky and risky, but for the locals, it is a piece of cake. For the locals, the palm is the most important plant. It grows all over Cuba, literally on every corner. It was the natural choice to become the national tree and is also included as part of the Cuban coat of arms. Taking down these palms without the government's permission is illegal and subjects the perpetrator to punishment. For the locals, the imperial palm is the equivalent to what the bison was for Native American Indians. They utilize every part of the tree, the roots, nuts, branches. Nothing goes to waste. From the roots, they make an elixir which is believed to eliminate bladder stones. The timber from the trunk is used to build village dwellings called boyos. This word was initially used by the Indians to describe a small hut on stilts. The term is still used today. The roof is made of leaves and reinforced by bark.
The boyos are not meant to be lived in. They are used as shelters to relax in after work on the plantations or at noon when it is too hot to work. The best known Cuban tobacco plantation goes under the name of its owner, Alejandro Robiana. He was the only man in Cuba permitted by Fidel Castro to manage and farm his own land and maintain his name for his brand of cigars. Recently, he passed away at the age of 91. The world press reported that Alejandro said of Castro, he wanted me to join a cooperative and I told him no. On average, it takes one year from the time a tobacco leaf is picked to the moment it reaches the counter of a shop. The leaves are left to dry for 40 days at a constant temperature of 38 degrees Celsius. They are then separated into different qualities according to texture and color. The Cuban premium cigars are unique because they are always made from whole leaves. The individual layers, the filling, the tying and covering leaf, never come from the same harvest. Each year, 100 million of these cigars are rolled. The rolling process is a science. It is important to first select the right leaf, even it out, roll it out, and then press. It is no wonder that the tools used to make cigars are passed on within a family from generation to generation. cigar is complete, even if it was not made on the legendary thigh of a girl. The town of Guantanamo lies about 30 kilometers from the American naval base. The U.S. military base is in no man's land, cut off from the rest of the world by barbed wire. Almost 100,000 people live in the town, and despite the prevailing peaceful and amicable atmosphere, the town's dilapidated state bears witness to the state of the domestic economy. Prior to its revolution, Cuba had the 20th most developed economy in the world, but 50 years of socialist management has ruined it. The local textile industry is one of the best examples of the revolution's impact. Prior to the revolution, dresses, skirts, and women's coats were made here. Today, the 50-year-old sewing machines only produce terry cloth made from fabric imported from China. Today, the workshop makes rag dolls that are shipped to tourist boutiques. Tourists are tricked into thinking that the dolls are a valuable souvenir and a product of the people's creativity, which they must buy. The once sumptuous city streets reflect Cuba's past glory, but so too does its music. For example, the song Guantanamera, the girl from Guantanamo, is one of the most famous Latin American songs of all time. The lyrics Guantanamera Guajira Guantanamera were composed in honor of a real beauty of a woman from the province of Guantanamo.
Over the years, the song became so popular that hundreds of cover versions came to exist. The original text and music were written and composed in the 1940s by Cuban Josito Fernandez. Pete Seeger, an American folk singer, consequently replaced Josito's text with verses from the famous Cuban poet, Jose Martijo. As we sway to the rhythms of the Cuban hit of the century, we bid Guantanamo goodbye, wishing for its people their longed for freedom. But for now, we will head to Latvia's Corland, where the communist regime fell over 20 years ago. And though its people are learning to live in a free country, some of them return to their traditions. Welcome to Kurland. To the north, Kurland's boundary is the Gulf of Riga. On the west, it is bordered by the Baltic Sea. It lies in the western part of one of the Baltic states, Latvia. The strange name comes from the pagan tribe called Koronians. This once feared tribe did not survive the bloody turmoil of history. A similar fate almost affected the Latvians who were, for decades, forced to suffer under Soviet rule. The Soviet regime took away their national sovereignty and suppressed the local traditions and faith. The chime of bells from the St. Nicholas Cathedral in Latvia's third largest city, Lepai, serves as an example of the huge changes that took place in Latvia since the disintegration of the Soviet Empire. All of the 13 bells are brand new. Some of them were a gift to the cathedral, others come from ships, and one was retrieved by divers from the bottom of the sea. The cathedral served as the headquarters of a Russian naval base at the time Latvia was a satellite of the Soviet Union. Unauthorized personnel could not venture into Karosta, a neighborhood in the north of Lepai, as well as the rest of the city of Lepai. An extra floor was built in the cathedral to stage boxing exhibitions. An officer's club was below. During the time of the Tsar, Karosta was a place of luxury. Today, Karosta's luxury is but a memory. The menagerie, or the riding school, once had a glass roof and served as a venue for riding shows, winter training, and ceremonial lineups. The lovely menagerie was one of the many casualties of the Soviet Navy sojourn. The only surviving building of the whole complex is the water tower, which still remains in operation. This rather obscure museum was built inside a former prison that was used by the KGB to incarcerate political prisoners. A visit to this site in Lepai will give visitors a glimpse of what life was like here under Soviet control. The tourists may purchase a two-hour or 24-hour stay in the prison. In order to experience what life was like for people accused of being enemies of the dictatorial regime. The visitors are still smiling a few minutes into the experience, but the longer they stay in the dirty corridors, cramped cells, and sterile interrogation offices, the more they doubt whether it all is just a game. Two hours in the prison are enough to realize just how frightening and dehumanizing the experience can be. Latvia as a whole suffered the consequences of the monstrous Soviet regime and the country is still recovering economically as well as socially.
The Libs are one of the nations that nearly paid the price of their own existence to the dictatorship. Today, only 177 members of this smallest nation in the world survive, and only 30 of those speak the Lib language. This boat cemetery is the symbol of the extinction of the once proud Lib tribe. Lives were fishermen, but the communist regime prevented them from setting sail for the open seas. In response, they dragged their boats to the edge of the woods in the vain hope that they would set sail again one day. Fifty years of lying in wait for freedom has claimed its price. Only wrecks are left. Only a flag serves as a reminder of the seafaring history of the Liv tribe. The blue in the flag is for the sea, the white is for the sandy dunes, and the green is for the woods on the cliffs a view presented to the fishermen each time they returned home. Today, even the purebred young Latvians show an interest in live history and language. Beatrix has live blood in her, passed on from her grandmother. She made the traditional live dress for herself and studies the live language, which is closest to the language of Finland. The Livs and the Latvians have one tradition in common, the preparation of wreaths for the celebrations of the summer solstice. The two nations have little else in common, even though years of cohabitation have made their traits and characteristics rather similar. In time for the summer solstice, the wreaths can be found almost everywhere. And for those who did not have the time to decorate, the markets sell wreaths, meadow flowers, and vegetables. The Latvians believe that all herbs and flowers picked on the eve of the year's shortest night have extraordinary healing power. Their pagan ancestors decorated their abodes, stalls, paddocks, and wells with boughs. So too, modern Latvians adorn even their vehicles with wreaths of all sorts. While the women use wreaths of flowers, the men decorate their heads with oak twigs. The symbolism is obvious. The bailiff has got to be as healthy and as strong as an oak tree. The evening is approaching and everyone is getting ready for the celebration. The giant constructions, known as the fire stairs, are made of wood and straw and took days to erect. When the sun sets at about 10 p.m., thousands of fires are lit. These are not ordinary bonfires. The original fire stairs seen here are the work of American students from the University of Buffalo. They have spent the whole week building it from straw and timber, and now they alone must ignite it. Folk songs sung by Latvian ladies clad in folk costumes are always included in these types of celebrations. The younger generation of Latvians do not care so much for tradition, and so they play a disco version of the national songs. Everyone is awaiting the hour of 3 a.m., at this precise time, scores of brave participants take off their clothes in preparation for the start of the naked race. It is a 150-meter sprint across the bridge that spans the river Venta. Once upon a time, it was a traditional ritual for farmers to run naked around their land, while the women bathed naked in morning dew. Today, the whole thing is more a matter of entertainment. Let us bid farewell to Courland and hope that the Livs and the Latvians are able to completely shed their communist heritage. <laughs>